Uh, friends, come and take a seat. Uh, welcome, welcome to church. Uh, if you're new, my name is Dean, I'm the pastor here. Uh, and so it's wonderful to have you join us as we kind of launch into this new year, thinking about uh, really some big questions that we're asking God, about how would God answer, uh, who am I? Today our topic is, how would God answer, why am I here? Uh, and so that's our opening question to start with. So we generally kind of have a question just to get the theme rolling, kind of interact with each other. And so if you want to talk to the person next to you, or if you're sitting by yourself, you can just think for yourself. Uh, what do you think is the purpose of life? Just an easy one to start with. What do you think is the purpose of life? Share that with each other. Uh, so friends, we'll be thinking about that a little bit later. Uh, what is the purpose of life? Why am I here? Uh, let me read to us from 2 Timothy chapter 4, and then we'll sing together. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Uh, friends, the first song we're singing is Home, inspired by that passage. Uh, and so if you'd like to stand, we'll sing our first song together. Please stand.
be seated. Uh, friends, we have the kids with us, so uh, we've got a kids spot. Our, our theme for today is what is the purpose of life, kind of what is the goal of life, what are we wanting to do or achieve in life. Uh, and so I thought we'd do a uh, what brings me joy in life. So uh, we got 10 pictures, I think, and each of them will be a choice of two. And so we'll do the kids first, and then we'll get the adults to raise their hands and see if they agree. And so I'll give you the choice of two, and you can put your hand up for which one you think is better, right? So that's the game. So the first one, we'll go to the first one. Ice cream or cake? Okay, so put your hand up, kids, if you think ice cream is better than cake. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Put your hands up if you think cake's better than ice cream. Oh, that's... Oh, okay, two... All right, adults, ice cream, better than cake? All right, cake, better than ice cream? Ooh, that's pretty close. I think ice cream wins, but... Okay, next, we'll go next. Uh, beach or bush? Okay, beach or bush? So, kids, beach? Okay, bush? All right, I think the bush just. And so, adults, beach or bush? Beach? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, bush. Oh, no, definitely bush. Yeah, okay. The bush is the winner. Okay, next, soft drink or milkshake? <laughs> so, kids, soft drink or milkshake? Soft drink first. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, milkshake. And mom, you, mom you, can't, you can't force her hand up. <laughs> she, she gets to chew. <laughs> okay, adults, uh, soft drink? Okay, milkshake? Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right, next. Um, PlayStation or Xbox? Kids? PlayStation first? Okay, Xbox? <laughs> All right, adults, PlayStation? All right, Xbox? All right, don't care? Yeah, okay. Good work. <laughs> uh, All right, next. Chips or hamburger? Hot chips or hamburger? You can't have both? Okay, so kids. Kids, hot chips? Okay. Hamburger? All right, adults, hot chips? <laughs> All right, hamburger? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. All right, next. Uh, ball, sports or bike? Ball or bike? Okay, so ball or bike. So we go kids first. Ball. Okay, bike. <laughs> she went ball, bike. <laughs> All right, adults, ball. Okay, bike. All right, there you go. Wow, okay. All right, next, lollies or biscuits? Okay, lollies or biscuits. So kids, lollies? Lollies, yeah. Lollies, biscuits? No biscuits. Okay, adults, lollies? Okay, biscuits. Oh, wow. Good work. Okay, uh, what do we got? Two more to go. Uh, indoor or outdoor? Would you prefer to be indoors or outdoors? Okay, so kids, indoors? Yep, yeah, yep. Outdoor? Okay, adults, indoor? Okay, outdoor? <laughs> All right, let's move. Everyone outside. <laughs> Okay. Oh, no, two more to go. Okay, pizza or nuggets? This is definitely a kid's one. Pizza or nuggets? So, pizza? Okay, nuggets? Okay, all right. Uh, adults, pizza? All right, nuggets? <laughs> okay, last one. You get the choice. Water park or Jumping Castle Park? So water park or jumping park, right? I okay, say so kids, water park or water park? Four, okay, jumping park. Oh, okay, three. All right, adults, water park? All right, jumping park? Oh, that's pretty close. That's not too bad. All right, well done. So we're thinking about that. We're thinking about things that we enjoy, things that life is about, things that bring us uh, kind of joy, things that are serious for us. Uh, what is the purpose of life? We're going to sing our kids' song. Um, and so if you'd like to stand and we'll be led with He is the King of Kings.
Good morning. Um, as you can see on the screen, we, we're going to be reading the book of Micah, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Uh, please bear with me. There's a lot of big words and names, and I'll probably get all of them wrong. Chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. Hear what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you, mountains. The, this word I can't get either. Just <laughs> of the Indictment. That, that, that's it. Indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Noab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and, and bow my soul before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oils? Shall I give him my firstborn for transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love, kind, to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Thanks, buddy. Great job. Uh, one of the things we try and do in the school holidays is involve youth and children in our running of the service. Uh, they're just as much our church family as the adults, and so it's great to have you read for us. And I think uh, two of the deans will be praying for us very shortly. Uh, friends, just uh, a few announcements. The first is a reminder, this is the series we're in for January. Uh, we're up to week two, which is why am I here? But the next two weeks will be, why do we suffer? So that'll be next Sunday. And then, God, are you happy with humanity? So there are two questions you uh, think would be uh, worth thinking through and wrestling with. Uh, let me encourage you to join us next Sunday and the Sunday after. Um, uh, two events as we start the year. Our first men's event of the year is Tempin Bowling and Mini Golf. So it'll be on uh, Saturday, the January the 27th. So uh, that's two Saturdays away, three Saturdays, two Saturdays away. Um, it's 6.30pm. You've got a choice. You can play two games of Tempin Bowling or you can play one game of Tempin Bowling and one um, Mini Golf. Okay, so uh, men, this is time for the competition to see who's the best. Uh, uh, just a time to gather together, enjoy fellowship. And so uh, if you're interested, speak to Joe. Uh, Joe's, uh, his family are away uh, this Sunday, but next week they'll be back and oh, speak to Joe uh, and uh, let him know you want to come. Uh, Tempin Bowling or Mini Golf, all at the same place. Uh, our first women's event. Do you want to speak to this, baby? Paint and sip. Which I'm presuming is not sip, paint. <laughs> paint and sip. Sip. 
Uh, so, the 24th of February, women and uh, girls from about 10 years old or so onwards are invited here in the hall for a paint and sip afternoon. Uh, now, the wonderful Holly, who has just been studying art therapy, is going to be uh, leading us in this and I have actually seen the artwork that she's planning on having us all do and it looks fantastic and not too difficult. So she's actually going to run us through it uh, and we are also going to be having mocktails, so fruity non-alcoholic drinks, okay? So that's the sip uh, part of that. Um, it's a great afternoon because this will require um, a lot of material, we do need to know numbers because if you turn up on the day and we don't have easel um, canvas and enough paints, then you will be sitting there eating food. <laughs> and sipping. <laughs> and sipping. <laughs> uh, so, uh, please think about who you might like to invite along to this um, uh, and uh, pray about coming along, setting aside that Saturday afternoon, 2 till 5, Saturday 24th of February here in this hall. Okay, so women and girls? Women and girls. Um, and there is a sign-up form over here for this and for the men's thing uh, in lieu of Neo being, not being here so yep. that we get cool. numbers tough. Yeah, so the men's event is for boys as well. So if you want to bring your sons along, more than welcome to, for that to happen. Uh, friends, part of this series is uh, having Q&A because there, there are challenging topics and uh, worth wrestling with if I don't cover things in the topic or you want to add something or want to ask a question. So there'll be time of Q&A towards the end. If you're not comfortable just raising your hand and asking in this forum, you can text it to 0433 295 214 and so I can answer it from there or you can simply ask if you have a question. Uh, we are going to pray and as I said, I think uh, the deans are leading us in prayer. Thanks, guys. Please join us in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can meet as your church to encourage one another hear your word and sing praise to you. Hear our prayers today, Lord, and guide our hearts to do your will. We pray for those who are unwell or struggling through this through different trials. Give them patience and perseverance to keep trusting you in all circumstances and help us to love and care for them. We pray for Camilla that she will, ha she will have relief from her back pain and that the doctors will listen to her and give her the best care possible. Thank you for Nahum and his 18 years and we pray that he would continue to grow in faith and acknowledge of you. We pray for Adam and Avril, Caleb and Anna as they prepare for Madagascar. Give them strength, strength as they leave their family and comfort knowing that you are the same God everywhere. Prepare the hearts of the people they, they minister to that they would come to us a saving faith in you. Father, we pray for all those who are getting ready to go back to school. Prepare the kids and teachers for a great year of learning at, either, at, either at school or at home. We also pray for the Sunday, Sunday school teachers, youth group leaders and Bible study learn um, leaders that 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 they would be excited for an, another year to teach to teaching you your word. Thank you for the beautiful con creation of the sound of the birds and the smell of and colors of the flowers. We, the amaze, maze, amazing ocean. There is so much to enjoy. M most of all we thank is for Jesus. Thank that he died for our sins. Help, uh, help us to be so excited about the this that we w want to tell everyone. We pray this week, Lord, that we would help us glorify you in our word, that 
those and actions and that every day we would practice being godly in Jesus in Jesus name we pray amen Good morning. Today's second Bible reading uh, comes from uh, John chapter 10, starting at verse 1 to verse 10. John chapter 10. Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find the pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. One of, the, um, one of the joys I have of meeting with couples getting married uh, is when we do a session on uh, finances, uh, which sounds a bit strange, but the, uh, the joy for me comes with asking the question, uh, what is your goal in life? Uh, because I, I don't imagine many of us ask that question. You know, if we're getting married in early 20s, for example, we're not really thinking what do we want to achieve by the time we get to 65 or 70. And so it's a great question to ask and and to kind of wrestle with a couple and asking, well, what is your goal in life? And then what is your goal in life in terms of your finances? And so I give examples. So, for example, um, do you want to, you know, retire early? Is is that a goal that you have? Do you want to retire with three homes? You know, do you want to simply get to the end of uh, your working life and then be able to say, I own a home and I'm content with that? Um, Do you want to travel? You know, do you want to have a large family? Um, Do you want to live on a large property? Um, Do you want to just simply enjoy life and say, I'll worry about everything later? Because whatever your goal in life is, then that affects what you do with your finances, with your money. Um, And so, you know, if you you decide, if I'm meeting with a couple and they say, we really want to own three homes when we retire, I'll say, that's great. Um, You need a good paying job. Um, You need to work hard. You need to save money and you need to not go out and eat. You need to eat at home, right? Um, you know, if you want to travel, that's great. Uh, but if that's the main goal you have, then owning a home becomes secondary. Like, it's not as important for you, and so you need to factor that in. If you want to have a large family, um, like we do, then you need to know you're going to spend all your money on feeding them and have nothing left, you know? And so these are decisions you make. Now, we're okay with that. Kath and I, we made a decision early on in our marriage that we kind of want to enjoy the life we have. And I've talked before that my death weighs on me a lot. And so I, I'm aware that I could die at any point and I don't want to... I, I didn't really want to work towards owning a house to actually not get there and ever enjoy it because I might die early. And so we kind of had this thing weighing on us and we wanted a large family which then factors into how much money we have to spend. We wanted to go on holidays and travel. We want to go to Bible college. And so early on we, we sold the house we were buying kind of aware that we wouldn't probably buy another home. Maybe when we retire, if things work out a certain way, but kind of we had this awareness that we, we can't take it with us when we die. We want a large family, and so dividing up between a lot of amount doesn't give them a lot anyway. Um, and, and so we kind of 
we get provided with a home as well. So that, like, I, it's a different situation for us. We get provided with a home across the road, so it is a different situation. But when you're kind of wrestling with couples, I'm just, I'm just wanting them to think through, well, what are you wanting to achieve in life? You know, what is your goal and how do your finances fit into that? And then are you content with that decision? Because if you are, then you've got to work hard to, to live for that decision. Because whatever you decide, it's fine as long as you agree that that's the goal you have. Right? And I meet with a lot of Christians, uh, non-Christian couples getting married. And so it's always, look, you make the decision, you agree with that together, then, then that, give, it, give it all your energy. That's what you should try and do. Um, but I, I, I always were trying to say to the couple, um, but whatever that goal is, that's not the purpose of your life. Right? So the goal is, that's what you want to do. That's what you want to achieve, or, or maybe that's what you want to be known for. And that's, that's all good. There's nothing wrong with that. But the purpose is, why are you here? And that's a slightly different kind of question you want to ask. Now, it's, it's not that our goal doesn't shape our purpose. I think it does. You know, if you want to play cricket for Australia, for example, if that's your goal, then that will drive getting up every morning. That'll be the purpose for why the first 30 years of your life are kind of driven in a certain way. <clears throat> Um, but ultimately, uh, the purpose of your life is bigger than simply what you do. Right? The purpose of your life is why it is you do what you do. Right? And so that's the distinction I want us to think about this morning when we kind of tackle this question, why am I here? Right? What is my purpose? Why do I do what I do? Right? So let me pray and then we'll have a think about it. Uh, Father, we do thank you uh, for your word. And as we think about this topic today uh, and what it means for us to exist uh, may you uh, make us aware of your scriptures through our hearts and minds uh, and just allow us to wrestle with this as a question that uh, is kind of important for all of us to, to work through. And so, Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, friends, we are two weeks into this four-week series. Uh, last week, our question was, who am I? Um, the follow-on, the natural follow-on of that is, why am I here? And so my plan today, similar to last week, is simply to, to approach this from two perspectives, from the you perspective, Right, so how do I answer that question? If, if there was no God and this is life is all that there is, how do I answer that question? And then how do I answer it with light, in light of the fact that there is God? And how would he answer that question of, of why it is uh, that I'm here? Right, so we'll start with the Dalai Lama. Um, he's not your average Joe in society. Uh, but his view of why we're here, I think, is one that probably resonates with a lot of people. Um, he says that the purpose of life is simply to be happy. It's the Bobby McFerrin, don't worry, be happy. Right? Whatever's going on, whatever you're doing in life, it should be geared towards bringing you happiness. Right? Now, I imagine most people probably agree with that. Maybe, maybe not have it on a bumper sticker on our car or as a meme we put on social media regularly, but it's something we're trying to achieve in life. Right? Our desire is to be happy. Right? Our desire is to be around people who are happy, to make other people happy. But when was the last time you were truly happy? Right, just give it that thought. When was the last time I was truly happy? Kind of laughing at your own jokes, happy. You know, someone comes to the door and says, would you like to contribute to the local pool? And so you give them a glass of water, happy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of just content in life, happy. Right? When was the last time you were truly, truly happy? Like, I think it's a wonderful goal. I think happiness in life is a wonderful goal. Uh, but I think life is so complex at times that kind of... I think I find myself searching for happiness more often than I find myself experience happening, happiness. And so I kind of ask the question, well, if happiness is the purpose of life, do I get to achieve that? And when do I get to achieve it? When do I reach it when I can say, I'm continually happy? Right? Maybe not the Dalai Lama. We'll go to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Again, not your average Joe. But his approach to life, I think, again, is what a lot of people agree with. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger says that the meaning of life is not simply to exist, um, not simply to survive, but to move ahead, um, to go up, um, to achieve, to conquer. Right? Now, it's hard to argue with a seven times Mr. Olympia, um, one of the greatest action heroes of, of the modern era of all time. Four billion dollars his movies are brought in. The governor of California married a Kennedy. Like, it's hard to argue with a man who, who does struggle to speak English, but has achieved so much. <clears throat> he's achieved so much in his life. Like you, can't, you can't doubt what he's done. And he says the purpose of life is, in a sense, to climb the ladder. Right? Whether it's uh, success in business or whether 
it's uh, in success in sport or owning your own home or retiring comfortably or raising a family, living to an old age, whatever it is, the purpose of life is to finish higher on the ladder than when you started. Right? Now, I think that approach to life kind of drives many social issues. I think that's why young people are so attracted to social issues. Because there is a sense where, certainly for our younger people in society, there's a sense where, how am I going to climb this ladder? Like, everything seems to be against me, buying a house and, and getting a, a job when in jobs are, you know, it's hard to stay in a job. So how am I going to climb a, a ladder myself? Well, perhaps if I, you know, make a difference in the local community, or perhaps if I, you know, help out a minority group, or perhaps if I help a large corporation, then I can help them to actually climb the ladder. And then I can make a difference in the world in general as opposed to just in my own life. <clears throat> and so there's a sense where <clears throat> uh, that's kind of an evolution, evolutionary view of how we exist as a society. If I as an individual can help the world to be better, then I'm helping the world to just improve a little bit more than they were before. Right? It's, it's the idea that I can make a difference. Like it's like the meme. There's a meme which says, um, whoever said one person can't change the world never ate an undercooked bat, right? So we can make a difference in the world, just one person. If I support a cause, if I help out in some way, then I can make a difference and my life will have purpose, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's a quite admirable thing to do. But does it achieve purpose? That's what we're wrestling with today. You know, fighting um, inequality, fighting climate change, fighting a lack of education, fighting... Uh, world hunger, they're all good things and they will improve the world. But we're all still going to die. Right? We're all still going to die. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do these things. The Bible encourages us to care for the weak and the vulnerable, to care for the earth that we have. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't do these things. But if the only purpose in life is to improve this life that we're in, then when do we actually say, I've achieved that purpose? When do we get to say that? You know, is it when we reach a long life? Like if we all live to 120, right? which is a good goal to have, if we all live to 120, can we then say life is better? Like will our lifestyle be improved if we all live into our hundreds? Right? Or will we look out and it'll be like the land of the walking dead? Because like, we still decay, right? And so will we just look like older decayed people than we do already? <laughs> like, like what happens to our nursing homes and our retirement villages if, if we all live to 120 like what does that look like for a society is our life better if we actually live longer is that the goal right? is the goal to make the world a better place to leave a better world for our children than when we were children ourselves because I presume that's a goal of every generation but when do we actually get to say we've done it <coughs> you know, finally we can say that the world is better now than when it was when I was born um, perhaps a goal is immortality. You know, with all our scientific advances and all the lessons learned, it does feel like we're trying to get to that point of being able to live forever. It's hard to imagine, and it, I think it disagrees with the Bible. But if that's not our goal, what is the purpose of life without God? Right? Perhaps our goal is immortality through leaving a legacy. You know, if I can just leave a set of moral standards for my family that they will value, then I've achieved something in life. You know, if I can... Kind of, if I have an approach to life that is treasured by my friends and remembered, or if I can, you know, leave a property that sets up my children and then my children's children, right? Then I will have a legacy that I've left for my family, which again is a great thing. But it, it's not a, it's not an eternal thing. Like the legacy is only a short time. There's a great, great verse in Ecclesiastes chapter Ecclesiastes chapter one, which says, "No one remembers the former generations." And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Now, we want to disagree with that. Right? But I got, a, I got sent a text during the week by someone at church here. And it, it was a great text. It said, um, it was a picture and then writing on the picture. And it said, um, if you could go back 12 generations, you would have a total of 4,094 ancestors. Right? 12 generations back. And then the text said, so consider the struggles Consider the sadnesses, consider the difficulties, consider the love stories that brought you into existence. And it's quite humbling to think just 12 generations back is 4,094 people. But how many of them do you know? Like I'm only talking 12 generations. How many of those 4,094 do you know? 
three generations, I think that's it. If your goal in life, if your purpose of life is to leave a legacy, then you get three generations and then you're no longer remembered. Uh, Last week I mentioned Jordan Peterson uh, as one of the most influential voices of the last five years, according to a Times magazine article. Um, He says in terms of purpose of life, society at the moment tends to think life is about rights. Okay, so the purpose of life is it's individual rights, minority rights, social rights, and they're what give us meaning to life, fighting for an issue or a cause. Um, But what, what Jordan Peterson says is that's not true because rights alone don't achieve anything. Right? What he says is, for rights to have purpose, you must also have responsibility. Right? So I'll give you an example. Let's say, I'm going to use, use Sean as an example. Sean has never said this, but let's say Sean says, it's my right to sit in the front row of this building. <laughs> right? That's my right. right. And he can hold that right, but it doesn't mean anything unless I and you take on that responsibility to either say, yep, you can sit there, that's great, or no, and here's why. Right? So the point John Peterson makes is rights and responsibility kind of go hand in hand together. Right? And so then he goes on to say that for women, um, they find purpose in the responsibility of bearing children and raising those children. Right? Now, not every woman has a child, so we want to recognise that. And certainly in our modern society, many, many women work. But the point he's making is that men don't bear children. Right? And so that's their responsibility is not give, to give birth to children. And so generally, they don't stay home to raise the children that women do. And so their responsibility is to birth and raise children. Uh, for men, he says, their responsibility is to work, right? to find achievement in work or, or be able to provide for your family in work or whatever it is. And so you find responsibility at that point. Right? So rights by itself have to go with responsibility. And when you fail in your responsibility then you fail to find purpose. Right? So imagine a man in his early 20s who has a Peter Pan complex. Right? Interestingly, Peter Pan, the first Peter Pan movie came out 100 years ago. Right? So a person who has a Peter Pan complex is someone who hasn't grown up. So, so a young guy in his 20s, Peter Pan complex, plays computer games all day, still lives under mum and dad's roof until his 30s. There's someone who hasn't taken hold of his responsibility, right? who's failed to take hold of the responsibility to work. Now, I think there's a female equivalent of the Peter Pan complex as well, which I think is social media. Right? Now, I'm still working through this in my head, but if we as a society say to women, um, your responsibility is not to have children but to work, and in their 20s, the women look at the blokes who are saying, well, they're not working, so why do I have to work? And so what am I going to do instead? I don't want to play computer games because that's a boy boring thing to do. And so what I might do is I'll look on social media. Right? And social media is the kind of neverland of romanticising or fabricating your life so that I can maybe earn some money by doing nothing, right? And so I can find a Neverland where I don't really have to take hold of responsibility. Now, that's just one view, right? Jordan Peterson, I I think he's interesting. His ideas are worth wrestling with. But I think at the end of the day, I'm just not sure as a society that we have a satisfactory answer to why we're here, right? I, I, I looked through hundreds of, not hundreds, I looked through a lot of websites this week And they all had similar answers to the question of why we're here. It's to uh, travel and experience different cultures, um, to support your local community, um, to um, take up a cause or social issue, to leave a legacy, to be a positive person. They're they're the kind of normal answers as to why we're here, what our purpose in life is. And, And there's nothing wrong with those. But if that's it, then surely it's missing something. It seems to me that it's lacking something. You know, I've, I've officiated over 300 funerals and what becomes clear when you do so many funerals is that if this life is all that it is, if all we have is the 60, 70, 80, 90 years we've got and then there is nothing else and yet the world will continue for thousands of years on, there really is a sense of meaninglessness to our life. I mean, we're, we're part of a bigger picture but what part do we play? Now, if you want to write a, read a book about this, Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament is well worth reading. It's just an honest and sobering view of, of how to look at life in light of the fact that you're going to die. And, and so what Solomon does is he, he's a man who has everything he possibly wants. And so he writes from that perspective saying, well, I've tried all these different things with the mindset that says, well, what is the purpose of life in terms of work, for example? And so he looks at all the work he did. He built palaces and, and a temple and he built reservoirs and vineyards and, and a whole range of different things. And at the end of the day, he says, but when I die, I'm going to leave this to someone who didn't earn it 
and so probably won't appreciate it and may just squander it. And what have I achieved at that point? Now, that may not happen, but that's what he wrestles with. He, he looks at his wealth and, and he says that I, I owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And I was so wealthy, I had so much gold and silver that kings and foreign kings and queens marveled at my wealth. And yet he still says, I wasn't content. It still wasn't enough. Because wealth doesn't bring you purpose to life. Like he looked at pleasure. He looked at the pleasure of laughter, the pleasure of wine, the pleasure of foolishness, just being a fool, um, the pleasure of physical connection, right? And so he's a man, he had 700 concubines and 300 wives, right? So he was a fool, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but he knew pleasure. He knew what it was like to have pleasure. And yet this is what he writes. It's so profound. He says, I denied, my, listen, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired, nothing. I refused my heart, no pleasure. Like it said, no to nothing. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my labor, my toil. And yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had achieved and experienced, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun because he's still going to die. Right? So work, wealth, pleasure, in the end, he says, does not give me purpose. Because ultimately, like Mick Jagger sings, it doesn't bring me satisfaction. Right? I just can't get no satisfaction. And so I'm not saying any of these things are, are wrong. Like We have all these goals, and I think they, they do give us a sense of purpose to life. But I'm just saying I think they lack something. Right? In a real world where we're all going to die, the, the you perspective of why I'm here is kind of falls short, of, of feels sort of empty as to is it a real purpose to life. Right? And so then we turn to God. And so we ask, well, what, what does God say? If we were to ask God, why am I here? What does he say? Um, we start with Micah chapter 6, verse 6. That's the wrong passage. Ignore that one. I'll read the one I've got. So Micah chapter 6, verse 6 says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Right? So Micah starts like that because what he wants to say is, in a world where you believe in God, the logical thought is to say, what does God want from me? If I've got to figure out the purpose of my life, I've got to ask, what does God want from me? Right? And what Micah tells us is it's a mistake to think that what God wants from you is this sort of outward religiosity. Right? This pretense of saying, I'm actually a good person when I'm not. Like, he doesn't want you to pretend that you've somehow achieved some sort of good person ranking in life. Right? What Micah says is what God desires is not this outward pretense, but an inward changed heart. Right? That's what he desires from you. And what does that look like? Well, he has shown you, O mortals, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Right? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Right? Now, I think it's fairly straightforward, but just briefly, to act justly is to live in a way where you make a difference in the lives of those around you. Right? It's to make the world a better place, like, like we talked about already. Because if you act justly, then you are trying to seek justice, you're trying to speak for justice, you're trying to you know, be justice, you're trying to bring justice to the world, and that's a good thing to do. And so those around you benefit, the weak, the vulnerable, the minority groups, they all benefit from you wanting to make the world a better place through justice. Right? If you love mercy, then you are compassionate, you are understanding, you, you, you show kindness to everyone you interact with. Right? Again, a wonderful thing to do. And again, what we've already looked at. Because I think someone who shows justice and acts justice justly and shows mercy, I think they're a happy person. Right? Because if you're, making, if you're making others happy by caring for them, then you have happiness in your own life. Right? And so these two ideas, act justly and love mercy, are kind of what we've already looked at. Right? What is the purpose of life? Well, to be happy and to make a difference in the world. And it kind of makes sense because if God created us in his image and likeness, then what society says are the purposes of life is going to align closely with what the Bible says are the purposes of life. However, it stops, or the person in society who doesn't believe in Jesus stops at that point. Right? Act justly, love mercy, be happy, climb a ladder, whatever it is. But it's not to walk humbly with God. Right? That's the difference for the believer. 
the believer is, has the goal of walking humbly with God. Right? Because the believer says, I, I want to know what God says. And what God says is acting justly and loving mercy. They're just two attributes of what it looks like to walk humbly with God. Right? The most important thing is walking humbly with the Lord. Let me give you a story. Our family, uh, Catherine, myself and our five children, youngest children, all went and had dinner with Joshua's fiancé's family during the week. Um, when you know this. When your children get ma- married, there's an obligatory dinner you have with your in- future in-laws to get to know each other. Uh, we did the same and our children have done the same. And so we went up and had dinner with Pretty. That's Pretty is Joshua's fiancé. We had dinner with Pretty's family, um, which we'd had before. Um, they go to the Anglican church in Rosemeadow. And when Catherine and I were in Rosemeadow with our older children, uh, we were invited to their place for lunch. And so we went to their place for lunch. They don't remember this, but I do. Because what's stuck in my mind is Catherine and I and our children sat at the table and they then cooked for us and served us, but didn't eat. So they just did that while we ate. And we conversed with each other and we, we talked with each other. But it was a strange experience to not sit down with others while we eat. This happened again <laughs> during the week. So Catherine and I and our five children and their three children all sat at the table. And Pretty's mother, whose name is Sal- Salome, um, she cooked for us and kept cooking until we couldn't eat any more. And then she gave us dessert and kept eating until we couldn't eat any more. And we chatted and we talked and then we left, having been fed. And I presume they ate afterwards. Right Now, is that Indian culture? I presume so. Um, is it Indian co- Christian culture? I, I would think probably yes. But it's a very humbling experience. You know, to have your whole family treated with the highest respect by two adults who willingly and happily served you is a very humbling experience. And that's what it means to walk humbly with God. It's to, to willingly and happily kind of look to God with the highest honour and respect. Like just to put God first and say that he and not me is the one I should glorify in my life, the one I should exalt in my life. Or to go to the John passage that uh, Toby read for us, it's to realise that when Jesus says, I am the gate, he's saying that I am the only way to get into eternity. And all you have to do is listen and respond. Such a fascinatingly wonderful passage. Because <clears throat> I think we tend to want to be, we, we don't want to be the sheep in the passage because no one wants to be a sheep because sheep are dumb. Right? And so we, we want to be the property owner. Like we want to be the shepherd. You know, we, we, we want to be someone of importance. An equal of some sort. But Jesus says, no, no, I am the gate here. I'm the, I'm the shepherd. You are the sheep. You just need to listen. And then when I speak, you just need to come through the gate when I say. And it's a wonderfully humbly, uh, humbling passage that just reminds you that when Jesus dies on the cross for you, you didn't do anything to earn that. Like, you don't deserve that. He, he just did that because... God loves you and he wanted to express that for you so that you can then have this gift of eternity. And so that's been given to you. The the whole point of John Chen is to say this is how you respond humbly to God. This is what he's done for you. And so you say, well, I need to respond humbly to what he's done for me. And then I need to show that to others. I mean, if God shows me justice and mercy, then surely I need to figure out how I can show justice and mercy to others as well. That's what I need to do in my life. And friends, at the basic level, that's, that's really the main difference between the you perspective of why I'm here and the God perspective of why I'm here. Um, the main difference is that Jesus actually brings purpose to your life. That, that's the main difference. I mean, as Christians, we're still searching for happiness, right? It's not as if we say, oh, we're Christians now, now we're got to be eternally sad. We don't have to be, like, we're still searching for happiness. And we live in the world like everyone else. And so there's challenges and there's sins like everyone else. And so we're still searching for that. But we do have this understanding that it's something we won't continue to experience because of sin. But we still want it. You know, as Christians, we're we're still wanting to make the world a better place. Because that's what we've been called to do. We're still climbing ladders, whatever that ladder looks like for you in your kind of life and your family or your work or whatever it is. We're still climbing ladders. And we're still taking hold of responsibility at work and at home. Right? We don't do it perfectly, but we're still trying to do that. The difference is, however, because I follow Jesus, because you follow Jesus, the purpose of my life doesn't stop when I die. Right? Jesus gives me purpose because this life is not all that is. So it doesn't stop when I die. As Jesus dies and then rises from the dead, what he promises is that he will rise me and you from the dead. And so the purpose that I have in life is actually 
an eternal purpose that then reshapes how I live now. Right? I'll give you an example. Catherine and I are going to New Zealand in two weeks uh, for our 30th wedding anniversary, and we're, we've booked specific accommodation that we wanted. And so we kind of booked about six months ago, which means that for six months we've been looking forward to this holiday, but still working and living here while we await that. And now we're two weeks out. There are many things, there are a few things we still have to do to prepare for our trip, but there are a few things we still have to do here as well. So we, there's a few things we have to do for New Zealand, a few things we have to do here because our children aren't coming with us because that's not the way to... Well, you could take your children on a 30th wedding anniversary, but we're not. Um, and so they're, they're being looked after, and so we've got to provide food. We've got to make sure all they're taken care of. And so we're kind of living in two worlds at the moment. Our mind is in New Zealand, but our mind is also here, right? And I think that's what it's like to understand what life is with purpose when you follow Jesus. Because your mind is where you're going to be in eternity. That's the promise. That's what we're looking forward to. But I'm not there yet. And so I've got to figure out, well, how do I live now in light of what is promised to me later? How do my decisions now, how do my actions now, how do my words now affect the lives of those around me, but also affect it in such a way that it flows through to eternity? And so when you get to ask God, why am I here? If you had that opportunity... Um, I think he would say to you, I think his answer would certainly not be empty and would certainly not be missing something, but I think he would say to you, you are here to live. That's why you're here. To live until I say it's time for you to no longer live. And so as you live, you're to live for me because I gave you life and you are to live for others because that's how I've expressed my love for you. And so your life has purpose because what you do and say now, it honours me. Like your life has real purpose. But it doesn't only honour me because it actually, you actually make a lot of difference to the lives of the world around you. Right? So everything I've said this morning, everything the world says that this is a you perspective, it's not really wrong. It's just when you understand it from God's perspective, it gives you purpose because God says your life has purpose to live for me and to change the world of those around you. And how do you do that most importantly? You do it by talking to people about Jesus. Right? Because... You can make someone's life better now, and that's a good thing for us to do. But how much better it is to make someone's life better now and then to have them aware that they now have the promise of eternal life. That from what you've said to them, they now can walk through that gate like us into eternity. Because then your life, it not only has purpose now, but it has eternal purpose. Like your life has eternal purpose because you get to reshape the lives of those around you right now. And that's a much different answer Right? I have 60, 70, 80, 90 years maybe to find purpose in life or I can find purpose in life now that will carry me through to eternity. It's a much, much different answer. Uh, friends, let me pray. Uh, Father, we do thank you uh, that you are our God and that you give our life purpose. Uh, and yet we still wrestle like everyone uh, with trying to find what our goals are, trying to achieve our goals, trying to figure out where this world and, and eternity connect and disconnect. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us uh, to find real purpose for our life, to write, find real purpose through you, through your word and in your son, and guide us to help our family and friends, and guide us to be able to say things that enable all of us to consider our goals and our purpose, to really wrestle with why we are here. And so, Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, friends, we're going to sing. Please stand.
justice and mercy embrace where the Son of God gave his life for us and our measureless death was erased Jesus to you we lift our eyes Jesus our glory and our prize we adore you behold you our Savior ever true oh Jesus we turn our eyes to you. Uh, so friends, Q&A, just an opportunity to ask any clarifying questions or something that may have come up that you thought, oh, I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, nothing on the phone? Yep. Is that, that, well, both of you. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Says, the love God and glorify him forever. Yeah. I know we're not privileged in that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> to know God and love him forever. Yeah, yeah. But, but if you look at that... That's not bad. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, what is it, David? It's to, it's to enjoy him forever, isn't it? No, God, God, enjoy him forever. Yeah. Yeah, he's laughing. Eh? He's got a big smile on his face. <laughs> 39 articles, possibly. I don't know what that one says. I, d- I don't know what it, I, I could look it up, but I don't have it in front of me. It's very similar. Yeah, I, I imagine it is similar, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or, or, you, or you can just open the Bible and come up with a <laughs> decision yourself. Yeah, at, yeah good. Uh, any other questions? But yeah, that's a good. No, God, enjoy him forever. Yeah. Yep. I think happiness is very fleeting. Yep. Yep. And I'm grateful to God for Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and certainly the Apostle Paul talks about that. 
um, to find contentment in life. You know, whether you're poor or rich, um, you can be content. It's just to find contentment in, in what you have. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the Apostle Paul also speaks about this being the joy of the Lord yeah. as opposed to the peace of the world, the inner joy of the Lord. The inner joy of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I th- there's certainly... Uh, having faith and, and enables you to understand life, I think, how we're meant to, and the good and the bad. And, and so to enjoy Jesus even in the bad times of knowing kind of... Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. We're very much aware in the bad times yeah. that he's walking with us. Yeah, and I'll touch on that a bit next week with the topic of why do we suffer. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, uh, We'll be around afterwards, so if you've got any more questions, you can come and ask. Um, But otherwise, we'll sing our last song, and then I'll close off it. Please stand.
of the redeemed. Just uh, as a reminder, next week, uh, our topic is why do we suffer? Uh, it's a great question. I, I didn't come up with it, but it's a great question because it, it presumes we will suffer in different ways and it's really just wanting to get to the reason why. What is the reason behind why it is uh, when God exists? Uh, why do we suffer? Um, so that's what we think about next week. Uh, please join us for morning tea. Uh, next week will also be Lord's Supper. But please join us for morning tea. So uh, morning tea is over there. Or you can flow outside. Um, I'll pray for us. Uh, Father, we do thank you for the day you've given us for the rain that's cooled the air just a little. Uh, and for this fellowship we have to be able to share morning tea and share our life together. And so we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.